call the uh, Capitola City Council meeting to order. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Council Member Bertrand. I don't see, actually, I don't see Jacques on the line, is he? Looks like Jacques is not. Wait, some phone numbers. Jacques, are you on the line? No, he usually shows up as iPhone. Yeah, I don't think he's called back in yet. I left my phone upstairs. Okay. okay. I'll just make a note of Great, that. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Botwer. Here. Thank you. Council Member Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. And um, Mayor Peterson. Here. Uh, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. You are muted. You can mute or unmute yourself by pressing star six. Uh, please hold. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, hold on. You are unmuted. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of, America of America and to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. All right. All right. I'm going to lower this just for a second for this monologue. Uh, in accordance with the current shelter-in-place order from Santa Cruz County Health Service and Executive Order N-2920 from the Executive Department of the State of California, this council meeting is not physically open to the public. As you can see, we have limited council members and staff physically present in the council chambers during this meeting. The rest of council has called in to participate remotely. As always, this meeting is cable cast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be, be to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on the Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Benjamin Thompson. Thank you for being here tonight, Benjamin. Despite being physically close to the public, participation is still possible. Public comment can be emailed to council for their attention during tonight's meeting. Identify the item you wish to comment on in your email subject line. Emailed comments will be accepted starting now up until I announce that public comment for that item is closed. Each emailed comment will be read aloud for up to three minutes or displayed on a screen. Emails received by public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us outside of the comment period outlined will not be included in the record. Lastly, we want to thank you for your patience tonight as we adapt to this different way of conducting council meetings for the safety of everyone involved. We're going to move on to uh, item two, additional materials. Are there any additional materials for tonight's agenda? Yes, there was one um, email regarding item 7A. Great. Okay. Uh, item three, any additions or deletions to tonight's agenda? Staff has no changes. All right. We're going to move on to item four, public comment. Uh, now is the time for members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. That would be via the email that was provided earlier. Are these our public comments? Yes. It looks, yeah, like, it looks it. like we've received one. Um, is this on an item on? Is this on tonight's agenda? It looks like it's not an item on, so let's just uh, read aloud. Hi, City Council. It seems that all grounds maintenance has stopped on the bluff tops on Prospect Street. This is an area heavily used by the citizens of Capitola. The weeds have completely overtaken the landscaping. Not sure if our public works crews have been laid off or reduced during this shelter in place. Is there anything that the community can assist with? Thank you for your feedback. Best, Rick and Mel Bento. All right. Okay. This is Sam. Could somebody repeat that comment? Yeah, so it was, um, do, you, do you want me to read the whole thing aloud or paraphrase? Oh, 
I don't think they were able to hear it on the phone. Oh, unfortunately. So I will share the screen. I, did, I didn't realize I wasn't sharing the screen. Can you see that, council member story? Yes, I can see that. Thank okay, you. Great. Was there any additional uh, public comment? That no, was that received? was the only one we received. Okay. All right. Um, seeing no additional. Uh, seeing no additional uh, public comment, we will move on. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to item five: city council and staff comments. Does staff have any comments? Not this evening, I don't believe. No comments, staff. No. All right, um, council members. Let's start. Uh, council member Bator, if any comments. I think I need to unmute I all. I think maybe. we need to unmute everyone. One second. All right. Okay, we're unmuted now. Council member Bator, if any comments. I do. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I have some comments I'd like to make about some ongoing. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 has no doubt impacted the... There's a lot of background noise. Sorry. We're going to try to mute everyone else. Um, uh, just give us one second. Uh, you are muted. Oh, man. Why? Can't you just unmute one at a time? It, it just gives me that. No, on the other side of more, doesn't that button say unmute? The one right next to it? Yeah. You are unmuted. Should I go ahead? Uh, yes. All right. Go ahead, Councilmember Bautorf. Okay. Uh, COVID-19 has obviously impacted the entire world. I'd just like to make a few comments on some local issues. First, I hope we can all recognize that this is an unprecedented event. Most of us have never lived through anything like this before. I read an article in the Sentinel where a comment was made that we are all in the same boat. The author made a very important distinction. He said, although we may be in the same storm, we are definitely not all in the same boat. Most people have been able to keep working, are still getting paid, and have not got infected. In reality, they have been severely inconvenienced. I place myself in this category. But to others, this has been a devastating event. They other families have become either infected or died. Some are face facing huge financial loss. We need to remember that there are a lot of people who need our assistance, and those of us that are capable should be making an effort to help out. Numerous incidents of this good kind of behavior have already been demonstrated throughout our town and across the nation. It is something for us all to be proud of. Although with tr tremendous acts of good behavior, there was always a small amount of bad behavior that grabs the spotlight. Similar to the looting scenes we see in hurricane aftermaths, there are always those that go against the tide or find flaws in the system. The constant media turmoil and playing of Monday morning quarterback does us no good. We are all where we are for any number of reasons. The difficult task is how we move forward wisely and safely. I have been following next door, and quite frankly, the pettiness of most of the threads is disturbing. After this is all over, we will definitely look back and remember those that performed remarkable deeds. We will also look back at those that demonstrated bad behavior. I suggest that before you publicly take a position to criticize the efforts of those doing their best to get us through this, Ask yourself, how do you want to be remembered? I find it disturbing that one of our planning commissioners decided to comment on the performance of our police officers as being heavy-handed with regards to COVID-19 guideline enforcement. To that point, I would like to convey my utmost appreciation and support to the members of the Capitol Police Department. We are asking them to do the impossible. Not only they're performing their regular tasks in this unsafe environment, but all the new guidelines, restrictions, and rules that none of us would have ever dreamed of. Tremendous amounts of people are living in close quarters. 
there were heated tempers, and there was a constant public outcry of civil rights being stripped away. These police men and women are getting the brunt of the complaints and abuse. Simply put, I want to say, give them a break. They are following the orders of so many people, and just for this once, can we all try to just get along and go along? In closing, I also want to commend all the healthcare workers, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedics, the firemen, and of course the grocery store clerks for their tireless efforts to keep us all safe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, comments? Oh, hold please. Let me see if we got you muted or unmuted. Did we lose him again? He should Madam be. Madam Mayor, we, I don't see Council Member Bertrand on. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Yep. All right. Yeah. So I just heard the end of what Ed is saying, and I think he probably did a fairly good presentation in trying to get people to realize that we're in extraordinary times. But I'd also like to reach out to the public in a positive sense that let's think about ways that we can make Capitola unique in how we come out of this situation. The way we respond, how we perform in terms of our civic duties, reaching out to folks that we live with, reaching out to folks that we use for the services they provide, restaurants, stores, all sorts of other services. We need to realize that we want to make this whole again. Try to think of parts in your life that you could devote to making that happen. The other thing that I think this makes us realize, and I'm probably repeating what a lot of people have already said, but I get a chance to say it in public. I think this makes us, in a very deep way, understand how interdependent we are. Some have essential roles right now, then the situation changes, and other people have essential roles. But all of our roles are important in making our society work. So when we think about what we're going to do when this starts unraveling and we start coming out of this issue, try to think of the things that you could do in recognition of the fact that you're part of a whole. And in that sense, you could help make the whole thing come back together again the way we'd like it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, comments? I have none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Story? No comments. All right. Um, I just have a couple brief comments. I want to echo um, what Council Member Bator said in thinking um, our police force, all of our frontline workers, um, and, and our residents that are, are following the shelter in place order um, with this good behavior. Please, I, I know that the, the weather is getting nice and we're all feeling a little bit stir crazy, but please try to stay indoors in your home um, as much as possible to ensure that we're not having people um, crowding on the sidewalks or on the beach. I know there has been concern about that. Um, I also want to additionally give thanks to um, our farm working community because they're a, they're the ones getting the food on the table and then our grocery store employees that are helping get get it out the door to our homes. Um, so I want to give a special thanks to those um, those communities that are doing so much um, to, to make sure that those of us who are able to shelter in place uh, have food on our tables while we do so. Um, I also have a couple quick questions. Um, so first I want to ask for a future agenda item. Um, the council had previously, uh, after recommendation of the Finance Advisory Committee, had made a vote to increase council salary following the next election, and I would like us to revisit that, considering um, that there will uh, inevitably be budget impacts to, uh, due to the COVID-19 outbreak. So I would like a future uh, agenda item to discuss that. Um, and then I just have a, I have a question for our police chief and for our uh, public works director. So our police chief, um, I've received a couple emails and I've noticed myself um, that it looks like there may be some shops in the village that are open or at least appear to be open. And I'm wondering if we're still doing patrols to ensure that the uh, businesses that shouldn't be open right now aren't. And if, if you could speak to that, thank you. Sure. 
Good evening, Mayor Peterson, council members, and staff. Uh, to answer your question, uh, on the front side, yeah, we are doing regular patrols. We have a COVID enforcement team uh, that currently works Thursday through Sunday, given where we believe most of the activity is happening. They are assigned specifically to the village and the Esplanade area. They're doing regular patrols okay. um, to gain compliance, to consider enforcement if that's the appropriate approach. With regard to businesses, we've received a good number of complaints, uh, calls for service, uh, and then other complaints. I've received a few via email. Uh, there are some flag downs in the field. The good news is the majority of those complaints of businesses uh, uh, operating illegally or not essential businesses uh, per the order, uh, they've proven to be negative. Uh, that we have not found uh, a business uh, operating um, outside of the current public health order. Oh, good. Um, good but we are getting complaints. Uh, we respond to each one of them. We're doing proactive patrols uh, to make sure that the businesses that are open, and there are a few of them, uh, are operating under the order. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All right. And then a quick question for our public works director. Also, just kind of following up from um, the public comment we received, I was wondering if you could give any uh, a brief update on uh, the activities of the public works department and if we've uh, increased decreased services or, or anything along those lines. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, yeah, since the shelter in place order went in place, we did decrease the amount of public works staff working at a single time to keep them separated and keep their exposure levels down. Um, so for the last six weeks, we have been operating with a half a crew at times. We realize that that has impacted some areas. Uh, starting in May, we anticipate uh, returning to a full crew and we should be able to catch up again pretty quickly after that. Great, thank you. I know you guys are doing great work and um, uh, absolutely crucial to keep that social distancing so it makes sense to have a, a smaller crew to keep people uh, not so close together. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I think that's all for my comments. So we are going to move on to the consent calendar. Uh, this, uh, these are items that will be approved in one motion unless any uh, member of the public or council member wants to remove an item for separate consideration. Let's start with, uh, is there any comments from any members of the public indicating that they want us to take uh, an item for separate consideration? No? Email? No, no member of the public that wants to? All right, seeing none. Is there any council member that would like to um, remove an item from the consent calendar? Um. Mayor, um, this is Sam. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't need to remove an item, but I wanted to point out there's a typo on the resolution on item 6C. Um, so when it's appropriate, I'll, I'll mention it. 6C. Yeah, that's fine. Do you want to go ahead and uh, quickly sure. just address that? Yeah, on, on the um, packet page 58, at the top of the first paragraph, it says um, that um, recommendation amendments from the Postal Commission staff on um, November 16, 2020. Um, and, and I believe that should be November 16, 2018. 2018 okay. or 2019? 2018, okay. Yeah, we can make that correction. Thank okay, you. great. So we will make that correction. Um, do we have, uh, so we'll entertain a motion to approve consent calendar with the, um, uh, with the correction made to the resolution. I still move. Second. Moved by council member Bertrand, seconded by council member Story. Uh, can we do a roll call vote? Absolutely. Council member Bertrand. Aye. Council member Bottorf. Aye. Council Member Story. Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We're going to move on to general government items. Uh, we're going to start with 7A, an update on the COVID-19 emergency declaration. Okay, Mayor and Council, I'm just going to take a moment here to pull this up.
Okay, so this is an ongoing series of, um, is the ongoing in our series of updates about the COVID-19 situation here in Capitola. Um, the county shelter in place order, as everyone is sure is well aware, is in place until May 3rd. We've been hearing more discussions uh, regionally about potentially a new order coming out that in some ways, we're not sure how exactly, potentially has some re relaxation in it. We do anticipate seeing something um, hopefully next week that'll help provide guidance for what may, may looks like for us. In addition, on April 8th, this was right about the time of our last meeting, <clears throat> all the uh, beaches and parks in the county were closed. Um, that was obviously quite a, quite a change for our community where recreation is such an important component of everybody, everyone's lives here. And I want to report that we had relatively good compliance. Uh, there was nobody in the water, which was sort of remarkable to look out at the surf camps and see nobody out surfing. And the beaches were largely empty. Our police department did a good job. We had a few, uh, few uh, violations, a few tickets that were written, but not very many. Um, I do want to reiterate that we have ongoing discussions about the beaches um, and how to deal with crowds on the beaches. And I do think that in the future, when we get to other holiday weekends, we may see future closures um, and what the shape of those will look like, I think uh, remains to be seen. Um, today, we had a new order that was issued by the health director requiring facial coverings. The new order takes effect, I think it's either tonight or tomorrow night at midnight and requires facial coverings when used inside in public places in, presence, in the presence of others. You don't have to wear one if you're working in your own office, um, but you should be wearing it if you're if you're interacting with others, particularly if social distancing cannot be observed. Um, facial coverings can be bandanas, neck gaiters, scarves, things like that. They should not be N95 masks. At this point, N95 masks need to be reserved for medical personnel and emergency responders. Uh, and there's just not enough supply that members of the public should be wearing those in public. If you have young children, uh, age two and under, they should not wear masks. It's not safe for them to do so. And under the age of 12, it's at the, at the parent's discretion whether or not they would wear them. As an update um, on the situation here locally, we have 114 known cases and there's been 18 hospitalized. That's not everybody who's in the hospital today. That's the total number of the 114. I think about more than half of those, I believe, have recovered. There's been two deaths in the county. Um, these are the cases over time. And you can see this graphic here showing a rel pretty, pretty obvious flattening of the curve. As we were seeing cases rise through the end of March, they've been relatively flat, uh, if not even declining through April. Um, City Attorney Zutler, I know actually we didn't have a chance to touch bases. Did you have anything at a statewide level that you wanted to update the council on? Unfortunately, there's not much. To, I'm sorry to get back to you, Jamie, but unfortunately, there's not much to update. You um, said in your presentation that you're wait that we're waiting for the county to issue the anticipated updated stay in place order. Um, the same is true from the governor's office. I know that some counties are expecting additional restrictions from the governor's office to come down, so that we will issue county orders after that. Those did not come. We were expecting the governor's office to issue a an updated stay in place order yesterday, loosening some restrictions. Um, that did not happen yesterday. The only order that came out yesterday um, regarded health care or it loosened restrictions around providing health care. Um, so that is not out yet. I think right now everyone is simply holding. I was just looking at the news when you were talking, Jamie, and it looks like um, the stimulus package just passed and had, is headed to the president's desk for signature. Um, so that um, that's all I've got for now. All right, thank you. Locally here, um, I issued an emergency order last week uh, and it was around the skate parks in conversations with the other jurisdictions in the county, particularly Scotts Valley and the county, county of Santa Cruz and the city of Santa Cruz, uh, we all discussed um, keeping our skate parks closed uh, for the time being at least. There were numerous social distancing problems and that was an enforcement area, um, an area where we're having enforcement challenges. 
Uh, so at this point, there is a resolution in your packet today to adopt to uh, confirm the, the order closing McGregor Park for the near term. We have talked about trying to have monitors out there to see if that could somehow help a situation where people make sure people are complying with the social distancing guidelines. The, um, the challenge with that, frankly, is from a liability standpoint, there's this particular set of liability rules that govern skate parks and, and cities' immunities around skate parks, the ability for people to sue you if something goes wrong in a skate park. And it changes um, pretty dramatically if, if there's a city, city is monitoring the skate park or if it's unmonitored. So as soon as you get into a monitored skate park situation, um, the immunities do do go away. So there's a challenge there that we're still we're still trying to work through. Hmm. Uh, a summary of the open facilities: the police department does remain open for walk-in visitors. Social distancing rules do apply. Our parks are open, with the exception of McGregor, as we discussed. Capitola Beach is now open. The play structures do remain closed. Um, City Hall at this point is closed. We are evaluating if in May we may be able to do some sort of opening or a partial opening, maybe to appointments only. The wharf is closed through May 1st for emergency repairs, <clears throat> the community center, museum, um, bandstand. And then in addition, I just want to let the council know that uh, we are going to be closing the cliff drive beach parking uh, spaces, just everything we can to try to reduce crowding uh, on our beaches coming up this weekend. In addition, I worked with the county and we issued a joint press release with all of the cities in the county, all the recreation managers intended really to give the message out that the beaches are not for people to come to from over the hill. Um, so hopefully that helps. If it doesn't, obviously we're going to have to look at more, uh, unfortunately, more draconian, draconian efforts, um, potentially beach closures down the road, because at this point in Capitola, there's not much more parking we can really close off. I do want to do a short uh, update for the public about the budget situation. As I'm sure everybody can imagine, the city of Capitola um, is heavily dependent on sales and hotel tax. Those two tax revenues make up more than 60% of our overall revenue. As a result, we are definitely as a city feeling the effects of the shelter in place orders and the pandemic. Um, we previously had talked about kind of a range of impacts from this quarter of this fiscal year. This is the um, April, May, June quarter. And at this point, we're forecasting about a 2.1 to $2.2 million revenue shortfall. Uh, and city revenues. Um, when we look at that, we also have been able to freeze some positions and freeze some expenditures, and we've been able to probably reduce expenditures by about 600,000 over that same time period. And so we will have a pretty significant net impact to our, um, our reserves and our fund balance here in the city, um, which will probably be in the order of a negative $1.5 million impact on the overall funding the city has available. Looking ahead to next year, uh, we're projecting at this point about a $4 million reduction from our planned budget from last year. The planned budget was anticipating about $17 million in revenue. We think that we're going to be looking at a figure closer to $13 million in revenue. In addition, we were already knew we'd had about a $400,000 to $500,000 hole that we were going to have to deal with during the budget cycle this year. So that comes on top of the $4 million revenue shortfall. So we have a lot of work for us um, to do as we move forward in the budgeting process. I just wanted to let folks know because I have gotten questions about how the how this crisis is impacting the city's revenue. And unfortunately, the answer is it is significantly impacting us and it's going to result in some very difficult decisions as we move forward in our budgeting process. So with that, it takes us to the recommendation, which is just to make the, rec the finding that the hazards related to the pandemic continue. And then in addition, it's to approve a resolution that ratifies the emergency order that closes McGregor Park until the emergency is resolved. And with that, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Story, any questions? No questions. Council Member, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, any questions? I just have one question. Um, I'm not sure who could answer this, but what um, steps are being taken to uh, address the, 
the folks that come in to town for our parking in neighborhoods. Is there a plan to address that or to mitigate that? I'm sorry, um, Vice Mayor Brooks, you're, you're uh, a little bit quiet on the monitor. I, am I understanding you're asking if there's any actions taken to prevent people from coming into town? So the question no. I think was about parking in <laughs> no. the neighborhoods. Par <laughs> That's what it sounded like. <laughs> parking in the neighborhoods, I believe. Oh, parking in the neighborhoods. I thought, yeah. okay. <laughs> so, so the question is, is with all of our parking spaces closed, you know, are we driving people to park in the neighborhoods? And um, one of the things we are looking at is whether or not we could start our residential parking permit program early um, it is certainly something we're evaluating. Um, I believe the county is looking at doing that in the Opal Cliffs community. Um, that's one of the things we are looking at potentially. I think, yeah. That answer your question, yeah. guys? Yeah, it does. That'd be great if um, city manager, if Jamie, you could maybe bring forward for us to look at what Live Oak parking program looks like. Um, so we can explore some of those options for our for our city. Okay. Great, thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Any questions? Uh, no questions. Councilmember Botorf. No questions. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, we will bring it to public comment. Is there any public comment uh, on this item that we've received? Apologies, this is taking me a little bit of... No problem. Looks like no additional public comment on this item. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to council uh, for comment. Council member Story, any comments? Discussion? No comment. Vice Mayor Brooks, comments or discussion? No comment. Uh, council member Bertrand? Uh, no comments on this. Uh, and council member Botorf? Uh, may, I, may I have a comment is I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. I'll second that. Councilmember Botorf motion, second by Councilmember Bertrand. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. Councilmember Botorf? Aye. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to item 7B, com considering a community survey. Staff report. All right. So first I want to thank, uh, we have Jean Bregman who's on this call. Jean is our pollster who uh, has worked for the city and done polling in the past. Uh, for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to meet him, he's a great resource um, to answer questions about polling and community sentiment. And so if we have any questions, he's, he's here to respond. Um, as council will recall, in March, you approved a, a budget for a contract to do some polling for um, $14,000 with Gene Bregman and Associates. The, really, the, 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 the pandemic situation sort of ramped up very quickly after that. And um, I did not proceed with executing a contract with Gene. I felt like that asking people questions at that point about how they were going to vote in November would probably not yield very useful information. Um, obviously, the situation has changed. The situation probably has calmed down a little bit from those crazy days in the middle of um, March, but obviously the situation is still is different than when we were looking at March 12th. We have significant revenue reductions, as we discussed um, in the previous item, that are going to be hitting the city in our next budget. Um, the contract that was previously approved was going to be polling two different topics. One was a utility user's tax, which we were estimating to generate about $1.2 million in new revenue. The idea was that it would be a relatively short-term thing that was going to just bridge us until the mall was done. Sounds like kind of a quaint notion now, um, only two meetings ago, but that was the plan. And also we were going to pull a Measure F extension and look at uh, potentially extending that beyond 2026. So I'm bringing it back to ask the council, number one is, is do, do we really want to pull these two? I, I, I would question whether Measure F at this point, given our near-term revenue needs, is something we would want to pull, given that we wouldn't see revenue from it until 2026. And if there's other items we might want to pull, um, 
So we did a little bit of research into a CFD, a Mellow Roos district. Um, it is something that we could do to pay for public services. However, I do believe that it's a two thirds, um, two, requires a two thirds voter approval. So it does have some challenges in getting it approved. Um, we also could talk a little bit about another sales tax. We do have some headroom on our sales tax. I know a number of other jurisdictions of the county are at the cap. There's a statewide cap in how high you can put your local sales tax. Right now, our figure is 9%. The cap is nine and a quarter. Um, our 9% our is comprised of seven and a quarter in statewide, the statewide rate, plus our two quarter cent district taxes and then 1.25 in regional district taxes that support the library, Metro, and the RTC. In the past, district taxes generated about a million dollars a year. Um, I think it would be foolish though to anticipate that that's what's gonna be generating going forward, but that is a 50% measure that in the past voters have, have tended to uh, um, support. Um, as I mentioned before, in Santa Cruz County, I think Santa Cruz and Watsonville are both a nine and a quarter. Um, and the downside, of course, is that we are very heavily reliant on sales tax, and this is in some senses just increasing our reliance on sales tax, but it is something that is relatively easy to get past. Um, we looked at increasing the TOT, obviously in the current climate, didn't seem like something that was worth spending too much more time with. We also looked at potentially forming an assessment district, and it just didn't seem like an appropriate, appropriate option for us. So at this point, our recommendation would be that if we are gonna do polling, that we would look at the utility users tax. Maybe we think differently about the term on it. Uh, we could consider a local sales tax. Um, I don't know necessarily if the CFD really makes sense at this stage, although we potentially could ask a question or two about it. And so with that, uh, I'm available for questions. And as I mentioned before, Gene Bregman's on the line as well if anyone has any questions. Great, thank you. Um, so we'll bring it to council for questions. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. The one thing oh. is, is I did want to talk a little bit about the timeline and the timeline is such that to get, we have to make a decision about putting a measure on, on the ballot uh, before August 7th, which means we would need to make the decision in, in June and July. Um, so it is a timely decision we need to make now whether or not we would do polling so that, because that takes a little bit of time to develop the poll do the polling, compile the results, and then present them to council where you could consider that information about whether we would want to put something on the ballot. So there is a little bit of a timeline we're up against here, and so I did want to put that out there that this is this would sort of be the deadline and then the recommendation. So I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. No, no With problem. that, I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Brooks, questions? Yeah, I just have one. If we were to consider tabling this, postponing the survey, I, I just don't know. When would the next opportunity be? What's the next timeline opportunity? You know, I would actually ask Jean that question. Is there another general election that we have planned that you know of that's planned for 2020? No, no, I think I think have to wait for uh, two years, essentially. I mean, it seems to me from everything I, I, that, Jamie, you were telling me, that with this enormous shortfall that's happening because of the uh, loss of sales tax, particularly in loss of TOT, uh, that you need some money now, whatever you can get, as quickly as possible to try to uh, make up some of this. So I think it, it does make sense to try to do something or at least explore something. Um, and frankly, b based on the three possible options that uh, you've been discussing, uh, the only one that seems to me to be even possibly viable is the utility tax, because that, first of all, only takes a 50% plus one margin for victory. The, um, the CFD was two thirds. And the sales tax, you know, you're not going to get as much because we're just, and that's part of the problem, is, is the, the lack of sales tax revenue. So that, that just sort of almost exacerbates the situation. Um, and we can ask a question of it if it looks like the utility tax is not viable at all, and maybe the sales tax would be, and better to get something than nothing. But I think um, 
that that the main thrust of the the poll should be towards the utility tax, and with a secondarily on the sales tax. Um, one of the things that you probably are all aware of is that the March 3rd election was a disaster for tax measures. Uh, we have not seen anything like that in a very long time with things, so many things losing. I mean, even school bonds, which, you know, 55%, almost two thirds of those are lost. Uh, so it's not, it's not a necessarily an electorate that's chomping at the bit to increase or invoke new taxes. On the other hand, uh, in a place like Capitola, where people do recognize that there are needs and will recognize that uh, uh, the shortfalls make sense, um, that it's probably worth at least seeing what we've got and seeing if there's a shot at doing something here. And we can we can test you know different levels of the utility tax as well. We, we can test. I, mean, I think the 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 1.2 million is based on a 5% utility tax. We could you know try a seven and a half percent, then a five percent, then a four percent, or three percent, and see if any of those um, are any or all are viable. Thank you, Jean. Um, I have one more question, um, and I appreciate you recognizing the shortfalls in our community. I mean, we were one of the measures that did were not that were not successful. So. Um, with that, Jamie, are we prepared financially to to campaign for something like this? Um, should we want to put something on the ballot? I mean, we're looking at deficit spending, and do we even have the money to, to push collateral out and and really campaign for folks to to support this? So. When we put an item on the ballot, the city actually cannot campaign. City staff, um, it really needs to be um, a community-led campaign. Um, so that's, it's not something that the city can, that I can do. So in the past, when we've had ballot measures, I know Council Member Bottorf could probably speak from experience, um, largely been the council members who have organized a campaign and helped fund um, the signs and going door to door and things like that. So that that would be I'm the sorry. reality. Oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I, I guess what I'm saying, you know, if this is a $14,000 contract, um, to get it on the ballot costs additional revenue. Doesn't it cost money to get it on the ballot too? So putting an item on the ballot when we have a general election is a relatively low cost. I want to say it's just a couple grand extra. It's like they charge us the marginal extra paper cost to print that on our ballot. So if we're already doing an election, it's not a huge cost. I mean, 1,000 versus 10,000, do we know roughly what that would be? It's a couple thousand dollars is the extra cost to put an item on when we have a general election. The overall cost of our general election, I wanna say it's closer to around 25,000, but that is for the, for one, just to, to sort of open the door and to have our city council election. So once you've opened that door, <clears throat> adding a tax measure, it, it's it's um, not that much. Okay, thank you. That's all for my questions. All right, Council Member Bertrand, any questions? Uh, no questions at this time. Council Member Bottorf? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Council Member Story. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mayor. That's probably a question for Jean. Um, Jean, um, yeah. how many surveys can we do with our um, uh, current contract, um, our, our budgeted amount? Um, do we well, do? We're, yeah. we're, doing, we're expecting to do 150 to 175. That's what we've been getting in the past. I must say, I think there's, there, I don't want to promise this, but um, what everybody is reporting these days is it's easier to get people to participate in the surveys than it's been in many years because people are just, they have, they're looking for something to do. <laughs> they're happy to have somebody call them and ask them uh, quest, questions about anything. Um, right. People have there's, there's lots of reports in, like the, in the uh, or various organizations I belong to uh, about that. It's, um, I mean, it makes our job a little bit easier, but I mean, it's, you know. Um, 
So I, I don't think that's a problem getting to that same sort of level that we've been getting to. Okay, and we could survey on the utility tax, uh, the sales tax increase, and also the Measure F extension. Um, I, I don't think it makes any sense at all to me, to to, to a Measure F extension now, because that's not going to give you any money now. Why, why would I, mean, it, I could see doing the, an increase in the sales tax? That, right. that makes that makes absolute sense, right? Well, but just to, just to just to extend something that's for the for you know what is it five six years down the road? Um, I don't think I don't think the voters would even care about that. You right? Um, that's I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a worth, worthwhile thing under normal circumstances. That would be just a final thing to take a look at. You know, maybe even. Uh, if we were doing an increase along with an extension of the Measure F plus the new increase, and the whole thing goes for a longer period, um, you could do something like that. But just just a just a plain um, uh, uh, extension just doesn't seem to me that meets your needs. Um, certainly not currently. So you're, you're you would recommend that to defer that and. Um, do another survey and an, another election um, closer to the uh, sunset date. Absolutely. Okay. And the other thing too about about what we're talking about for anything that gets put on the ballot this year, it's short, three four years tops, and it's really um, so that you can honestly make the case to the voters. This is a stopgap because of the strange and awful circumstances of all of our lives these days. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Sure. You're welcome. All right. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Would this be um, in person or phone polls? Phone. Phone. Oh no, it's not. not in, not, never, never in person. I haven't done an in-person phone survey in about 30 years. Okay. <laughs> it's phone and online. Oh, okay, great. And you said this would be June, is approximately when this poll. Well, I, I, I think the, the ideal timing would be probably starting maybe the week after. Um, Memorial Day, and depending on exactly when we start, we might even have the results to present to you on the June 11th meeting. Certainly by June 25th, it was delayed a little bit beyond that, that week after. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, with that, we will bring this to public comment. Uh, did we receive any uh, comments from members of the public on this item? No. Okay. All right. With that, we'll bring it back to council. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Council of Vice Mayor Brooks. Do you have any additional comments or discussion? Yeah. Um, I most certainly agree with Mr. Bregman about the the need and the availability of, of folks um, willing to answer the survey. My my concern is that. Everyone's going to say, you know, we're not interested in having any additional taxes at this time. Um, the the many different things going on right now, such as the, the pandemic and the presidential election coming up, all of these other uncertainties. So, although I feel that we we get the reply, my 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 thought is to spend fourteen thousand dollars. To hear that nobody's interested in, in voting yes on this is um, is a pretty substantial cost for us to be to um, be making right now. Um, so I have, I have some concerns about that. Um, I wish that the timing were different. It definitely made sense to ask our constituents to um, to vote on this, but right now it's just not making much sense. So those are my comments for right now. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bertrand? Uh, no comments. Okay. Councilmember Botchorf? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a different of opinion. I, I, I think that uh, right now this, uh, I think the citizens of Capitola are very uh, in tune to what our needs are, and I think they respond well to that. 
uh, you know, Mr. Bregman said that some of the school bo- school bonds were not successful, and I find that the history is is that bonds that deal specifically with Capitola have really been very successful. So um, we definitely have a shortfall. We have a shortfall that was unplanned for. Um, I think the finance committee was taking the utility tax as a, a way to, to generate, you know, extra revenue. I think that what that title does is it gives us a perfect opportunity to create a fund that can help us, you know, as Mr. Bregman suggested, it could be a short-term deal. This is a stopgap to get us through this totally unforeseen shortfall. I mean, we're talking 4 to $5 million. So um, I, I'm, I think that I'm willing to, to, to risk $14,000 to, uh, to ask the public, is, is this, are we asking too much? We're going to make a utility tax. We're going to try to get back some of the money that, that is going to come from no other source because I really don't have a lot of faith in the state or the federal government reimbursing us any substantial amount. Um, so I, I, I think that we need to ask the people, you know, are, is this something you're going to help us out with? Um, so that I feel that the utility tax is definitely a go, and I think we need to ask the question. The other uh, position I have is that, um, you know, the um, – the, the COVID has been sometimes called it, uh, I think the president refers to it as the silent killer or the silent uh, uh, deficit in our society. And what's the silent uh, killer in our, in our city is, uh, is our bluff. And, uh, you know, I've, you know I've, I've lived in the town for uh, 12 years. Uh, I've been fighting for eight years to try to get the city to take a position to, to uh, you know, embrace the neighbors, uh, to put up uh, some kind of a, ba- a battle against the Coastal Commission, try to do something to save our bluff, because I walk that beach uh, once or twice a week, and the crumbling effect and the falling effect is, is disastrous. Um, so, you know, when, when, when Mr. Bregman's on the phone and he's asking about what the people care about, what they want to do, I think it's important to ask people if they care about saving our bluff. I mean, we, it, we just can't go out there and all of a sudden unilaterally decide we're going to spend millions of dollars to save the bluff. I think the intention of the Measure F fund was to be a coastal protection fund. And what we found out is is that it was we only did it for 10 years. Uh, even though it passed overwhelmingly, I think we had like 83 uh, percent. It was short-sighted because it was for 10 years because we had no idea what the real cost of replacing the wharf was. Uh, we have an $18 million wharf repair, and we're going to generate out of that about, you know, $6 million towards the wharf. And with the state, maybe enough to pay for, for you know, a third or maybe a half of the repairs that are really necessary. And it doesn't leave anything for what I was hoping was an ocean protection fund. So I'm in this dilemma where, you know, Mr. Bregman says, yeah, we, we you know, what good does it do to extend it? Well, for me, it's like, you know, it, it's a bird in the hand. I mean, uh, you know, I, I would extend it in perpetuity. I would be creating a million-dollar fund that would go at the end of this. It would continue forever, and, and, the, and it would be earmarked. You know, I, I wouldn't want to say it's specific because then that changes it to a two-thirds uh, item. But, but, you know, the nature of this is that, you know, this is a fund where Capitola is going to seriously take a look at, you know, armoring the bluff and how we're going to do that. And so for me, I'm willing to spend $14 million dollars by fourteen thousand dollars, sorry, to ask those two questions, and then what, whether we decide to do anything with that, uh, that's a decision the council will make. But to not ask those questions right now, I think we, uh, I think we lose a golden opportunity. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Story. Additional comments? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think I wanted to just um, respond to that and tell her I, I understand her position, but. I think that with the budget show for fall that we're facing next year, that it's incumbent upon us to look at ways to not only cut expenses, but also at the same time see if we can increase revenues. And I don't think that we should um, pre-assume how uh, the residents or the voters in Capitola are going to react. Um, my experience is that they're generally, if you have a good uh, case statement, um, um, that they always respond positively. Um, and so I think that um, 14000 is a reasonable investment uh, to look at increasing our revenues for next year. Um, and because it's going to be um, a significant reduction in services um, if we don't look 
at uh, alternative revenues. So I would want to focus on increase in sale tax, ask about the utility tax. I'm not particularly in favor of utility taxes, but I, I think we should ask the question. Um, and, and even ask about the CFD um, and, um, uh, and to see what um, the level of response to, to that is. You know, on the Measure F extension, if we can put that off, that's right. It doesn't cure our, our immediate issue. Uh, and maybe we could defer that to a, a future date. But I think that that's also uh, going to be an important um, measure to bring up to um, extend that into perpetuity. Um, I would be a little leery about trying to add new um, special district assessments. Um, which are going to add significant cost uh, at this time. I'm, I'm just, I, it just doesn't feel to me that it's the right time uh, to be um, adding new expenses uh, and new projects to our budget uh, you know, in the next uh, foreseeable year. After we would recover, yeah, then we can maybe look at a special district uh, to shore up the block. Um, so those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did I get through everyone? Yes. So um, I, I share the concerns of Vice Mayor Brooks about the timing of the polling, um, but I also um, hear uh, Councilmember Botorf and Councilmember Story who have confidence in their experiences in, in polling, and, and um, I, I truly do t defer to their experience um, over my own. Um, so just to just to be clear, the fourteen thousand dollar contract, if we wanted to include uh, sales increase, excuse me, uh, increase of sales tax, uh, utility users fee, and Measure F increase, we could pull on all three of those on this one fourteen thousand dollar contract, or do we need to choose one? My recollection, and Gene, feel free to pipe in. I don't have the proposal in front of me. <clears throat> it was um, the cost is by how long the survey takes. And so I think we were trying to target a survey with the 14,000 that was about two, two um, tax questions. Two questions, okay. I think it was like, I mean, you know, so it's like $16,000 if we go to the next, the next tranche. Does that sound right, Gene? I think something like that, I have to, I have to look it up, but yeah. Um, hold on. I'm sure I've got it here somewhere. But if we did go a little bit longer, it was two thousand more. That okay. was the, and that's just the question. No, actually, actually, it's, it's only another thousand. A little bit more, a little bit longer poll and be fifteen thousand instead of fourteen. Okay. So if we did three questions, it would probably be fifteen thousand. If we did two, it'd probably be fourteen. Yeah. The question also right, is, is how, how deeply do we do it into a dive? Do we start saying, well, if you, if, if that was on the ballot, would you vote for that one? Oh, the I relationship see. between the two, it could just, it does get more complicated. Yeah. Do you want a UUT? And if so, do you want it at 5% or 7% or, okay. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. Those were my questions. So we've, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, I, I is have, that you? Yeah. I just had a couple follow-up questions. Um, just let me know when the time for that is. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so Mr. Bregman, um, yeah. what, what are the, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the SoCal school district bond that was surveyed twice, shown to be the results were positive on that, and it's failed now twice. And that's those are our community members, those are our constituents here who voted um, no on that. What are the demographics? Um, who are the de demographics that you are sur that you will be surveying during for this? Well, what we're surveying is people who are likely to vote in the presidential election. Okay. And, you know, based on we have from all the voter registration and voting history, uh, we know people who vote, people who don't vote. Yeah. Um, and you, and you, you, you're trying to make your best estimate of uh, is somebody likely to actually come out and vote in November? And then you decide whether they qualify or not. And in this case, this, this general election is going to be a very high turnout, I am sure. Mm -hmm. um, and much higher than what they would have had in March. Okay, and then my, my second question then, so my follow-up to that, and maybe, mm -hmm. Jamie, you can help me understand, once we get the results, and let's say Mr. Bregman surveyed 100 and whatever amount of people, what's the threshold of 
when we say yes, this is definitely going on the ballot or no? Let me answer that, Jamie. Um, it, it's not hard and fast kind of thing. I mean, sometimes you do a poll and you got, you know, you get 75% say yes, then it's not really a question. Uh, the, the, the problem is if it's close, uh, one way or the other, and then you have to sort of dive into the, into the cross tabs, into the demographics of what the results were, uh, to try to estimate which way is this most likely to go, what's best case scenario, worst case scenario, what kind of community support you think is going to be out there publicly uh, to support the measure, to, to ramp up the support. Um, you know, the advantage on all these is we're all talking about 50% elections, so that helps a whole lot. Uh, but there's, there's no hard and fast rule. Is, you know, if it comes in 53%, it's yes, but 52% it's no. It, yeah, it's, it's more of a if, – if it's – significantly beyond the 50 percent, then there's no question, or if it's, you know, below, well below the 50 percent, there's also no question. Yeah, and I guess that's my concern. Um, okay, that's that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Sure. All right. Um, well, we've been through all of the council members. We've all made comments, so unless there's any additional comments or questions, now would be the time to entertain a motion. I'm prepared to make a motion. Councilmember Bacharf, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we enter into an agreement, the staff recommendation with Mr. Bregman, to ask uh, two questions. Those two questions are setting up of uh, the potential of setting up a utility tax, and number two, about an extension of Measure F or some kind of a wharf protection. Uh, that's my motion. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Can I ask for a clarification? Um, yeah, of course. On the motion, and just I, I, Ed, I didn't hear in your motion um, to ask the question of increasing our sales tax rate to nine and a quarter. So, did, did you? I, I did me? not. I, I did not include that. I purposely left that off. I feel like. Uh, I've been had my name tied to many tax measures over the past eight years, and uh, because of the status of, of sales tax and, and the fact how it's going to be to come back, and as Mr. Bregman said, short term, I don't, I don't want to place another sales tax. I'm not ready to go into the nine and a quarter. I believe that we have more strength in the measure F, so I just limit it to F and the utility tax. Thank, okay. thank you for that question, though, Sam. Well, sure. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, so we still have a motion on the floor. Do we hear a second? All right, with that, it sounds like that motion dies for a lack of a second. Do we have a, um, would that be a substitute motion or just a new motion? motion uh, just motion. a new motion. Do we have any other motions? I, I'll, I'm willing to make a motion. Um, I'll move that we approve the contract for 14000 um, to ask, Two questions. One is concerning the utility tax, um, and the second is uh, increasing the sales tax rate from nine to nine and a quarter. I'll second. Okay. A motion by Councilmember Story, second by Councilmember Bertrand. All right. Is there any other questions or, or discussion? All right. Uh, hearing none, let's do a roll call vote. Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. Councilmember Botorf? No. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? No. And Mayor Peterson? No. Okay. Does not pass. Okay, so that motion does not carry either. I'll make a third motion. I'll make another motion. Okay. I make a motion that we enter into a contract with Gene Bregman for fifteen thousand dollars to ask three questions: one on about a utility tax, one about a sales tax, and one about possible wharf extension and or uh, well, wharf extension. Thank you. By that you mean Measure F. Ed. 
Correct, Mayor. Thank okay, you. Thank yeah, you. correct, Mayor. Measure F. Thank you. Okay, so Councilmember Bartorf uh, has made a motion for a $15,000, up to $15,000 contract for three questions that would include the uh, utility users tax, the extension of Measure F, and a uh, tax increase. So all three of the potential questions. That is the motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Just clarification once again. Sure. Um, the question, the survey question is going to be to raise the sales tax from nine to nine and a quarter. Is that what mm -hmm. included? That in is correct, motion? sir. That is correct, Sam. Okay. Uh, with that clarification, I'll second the motion. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, motion by Councilmember Bautor, second by Councilmember Story. Uh, if there's no additional questions, can we get a roll call vote? Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. Councilmember Bator? Aye. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? No. Okay. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Okay, so that passes. All right, motion carries four to one. Okay, we are going to move on to item 7C, which is an update. Uh, on the Capitola Branch Library construction project. Uh, thank you all very much. I want uh, Jamie, I will be in touch soon and we can start getting to work. Great. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you all. Bye bye. All right. So let's start with our staff report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight we're going to give you a, one of our periodic updates on the construction of the library. Um, I'm sure you all drive by it regularly and seen some pictures, but uh, we'll give you an update on the finances. Go on the next slide, Jimmy. Uh, excuse me. As you're aware, construction has been ongoing. Recently completed work, um, and the biggest one of that is the windows were installed. Originally, that we had thought we couldn't do that due to the conflict with the high power lines. But the uh, window contractor was able to figure out a way to install them from the inside of the building. They installed the biggest ones through the small windows and we were able to figure out a way to get it done. They haven't been sealed on the outside. Um, right now they're keeping the wind out and all that, but they're probably not waterproof, completely waterproof at this point. Uh, the existing exterior siding is about 60% complete. They're kind of wrapping themselves around. On the area fronting Wharf Road, they can get about, I'm going to say, 40% of it on um, prior to um, dealing with the power line conflict. All the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing lines are installed. Uh, the internal sheetrock, interior sheetrock is about 70% completed. The restroom tiles, tiling has been installed and they've begun parking lot grading and site grading uh, on the rest of the site. Upcoming work is they will get the exterior doors installed, which will help with climatizing the interior of the building. They will, <coughs> that's okay. They'll complete as much of the tiling as they can and they will proceed with um, the site work. Looking at the construction cost, uh, the contract value as of today is $11,690,910. We did issue a change order number five in the amount of $38,163 uh, per the policy which required the city manager's approval. That change order was from di differing site conditions and some unsuitable soil that they had to deal with in putting in the foundation. Um, to date, we've made payments of $7.3 million, which represents about 65% of the project. Uh, as far as the contract time is concerned, they've had 80 days of rain since they started project, which have extended the, uh, the contract days. But the real delay is coming from the conflict with the power lines. We haven't addressed that in the contract yet and will be here in the next month or two. Um, right now, with those anticipated delays regarding the power lines, we're, we're projecting an opening in the fall of 2020. Next slide, please. Thank you. Regarding the high voltage line conflict, uh, in December, a decision was made by the council and to no longer pursue the undergrounding option that we had been pursuing. Um, due to the cost of that work. 
staff uh, soon afterwards got together with PG&E management and requested assistance in de uh, determining an efficient, efficient solution that would allow construction to begin, but also allow the building to be built as it was originally designed. Uh, as you know, that's a big part of this is the overhangs on the wharf road aren't able to be installed, and we cannot work on that side of the building at the upper ends of that building, so we want to resolve both of those. pg e has actually been responding to this request, and they have prepared plans to relocate the high voltage lines. Um, that are in conflict. This work involves uh, new poles being done and mo moving the wires out on alley arms. Um, PG has indicated that this plan will be available in the next few weeks, at which time we anticipate we will get a, an invoice for them to construct these improvements. Next slide, please. PG&E uh, will not schedule construction for the project until we have made our payment for the, for the construction cost. They indicate that once we make payment, there's an eight to week, 10 week lead time before construction would begin. Um, right now, these are estimates that uh, the project manager and myself came up with. PG&E has offered no uh, assistance in telling us what these estimates would be, but we're we're estimating now that the cost for this uh, relocating the wines is going to be between three hundred and four hundred thousand um, dollars. Because of the eight week, ten eight to ten week delay on um, getting the project, the uh, PG&E construction going, we are recommending that we try and expedite that payment as quickly as I can. And we're going to be requesting it's in the recommendation that the council authorize the city manager to pay the PG&E invoice up to an amount of four hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. So I thought I'd try and give you a quick budget update. Next several slides um, relate to the budget. Uh, first, we're going to look at revenue. Uh, the first, the original budget, you can see in the first column of numbers there, we had a $15,150,000 budget. Um, since the project was awarded, uh, several of these revenues have exceeded uh, what we anticipated at that time. Most recently, Measure S, uh, we received interest payments from the library uh, joint powers agreement, and we also had some savings in the issuance cost of $260,000, $269,000. So those are additional revenues from Measure S that we can count on. Um, the successor agency money, the final amount was just uh, unknown when we adopted the budget, and it has now a final number at $76,000. Uh, City General Fund, I think that was just some movement, movement around, and $492 came uh, additional with that. And then the county library funds had an excess of $213,000, which they have allocated to our project. So given all that, and we also had interest earnings. So given that the additional revenue, we currently have about $693,957 available to move forward with the, um, in the project that we didn't have before. The circle numbers, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, numbers that are going to repeat later on in the presentation. So kind of remember those numbers if you can. Next slide, please. Looking at the cost, so a couple of slides ago, we had a construction cost of $11,690,000. That cost, just so you know, includes all of the change orders issued date, which includes value engineering um, and also the, the add-ons that we've done since the construction began. So that is the current construction cost. The current cost of engineering, architecture and engineering fees is $1.5 million. You can see the other costs come down. So our total cost... As of today, we anticipate is fourteen million and eighty-one thousand dollars. So, if we look at this in summary, we had a original budget of fifteen million one hundred fifty thousand dollars. <coughs> Current anticipated expenses expenditures of fourteen million one hundred eighty thousand dollars or eighty thousand, giving us a balance left over, which is essentially our contingency, which is one million. In 80, having trouble reading the numbers, so slightly over a million dollars. Um, just to refresh ourselves, we started the project with, with somewhere between a 650 and 700 thousand dollar contingency. 
we've taken money out um, doing value engineering. We've put money back in on other change orders. We had a significant savings of $300,000 in the uh, furniture budget. So that's where we are today. We have about a million left over um, in contingencies. Against that, um, our project manager has been keeping track of anticipated cost increases that we can see that will be coming to us in the near future and certainly before the project is over. Um, for the construction itself, he anticipates another $383,000, I think it is, of um, change orders. Uh, he's also putting in some money because we're going to see delay cost uh, for them from the contractor and the subcontractors due to the delays caused by the conflicts with the power lines. Um, these are all estimated costs. I think um, our project manager feels pretty good about the change orders that are anticipated. He's been really good at tracking the cost and anticipating them. The delay cost, um, to give you an idea, tech, um, if we hadn't had the wires, conflict with the wires, we would probably be nearing construction, end of construction right now. It was scheduled to be done in May. Maybe with the rain delays and all that, we've gotten to June. Right now we're looking at September, October. So those are delays. The contractor's on site for more of the time. He's got you know overhead and all that that are all compensable uh, delays. So that's where that $4,333,000 comes from. So if you look at that, and that gives us a total of $822,000 of anticipated changes. So the last third to the last line. So our net contingency available today from the original budget would be $246,000. If we add to that the additional revenues that the project has received, we have slightly over $900,000 in available funds. And that's where the $400,000 payment from PG&E will come from. And any at this point costs that we haven't anticipated. So I think I have a few pictures here I'd like to share. So these are that were taken. I can't remember if it was March 31st or, or near the beginning of April. Um, this is the outside of the children's area. Uh, this is the area where the deck will be. You can see the windows have gone in. The, the door is uh, what's remaining there. And it also the beginning of the tiling. Next slide, please. You've all seen this picture just driving by the site. Uh, this is what the windows just started going in. I think the small windows are still missing here. But it... Uh, it's certainly beginning to look pretty grand with those windows in there. Next slide, please. This is the interior of what is the main library library area. Um, it's where the librarian desk will be, the adult reading room, the adult stacks, and the fireplace room. The fireplace is technically behind where this picture was taken, so this is looking south toward uh, Clare Street and the big windows in the, in the end there. But you can see the inverted ceiling that we have. Um, that will get planked over uh, as we do the interior finishes. I think there's one final picture. This is just uh, sheetrock going in. This is inside the community room. Uh, the uh, small opening on the left there is the kitchenette that is being constructed, and the two openings to the right are storage closets. So you can see we're moving forward. We're working quite a bit on the interior of the building at this point, and I would say the contractor is doing everything he can to uh, keep the project moving forward even with the conflicts. So one more slide. So that's the end of my report and our recommendations are you accept the report and authorize the city manager to pay an anticipated PG and invoice, invoice for, me, for uh, resolving the high voltage power line in the vicinity of the uh, building and the amount not to exceed $400,000. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, do you have any questions? Do we still have Council Member Bertrand with us? Oh, we had you muted. Council Member Bertrand, do you have any questions? Yeah, right. So um, pg &E has not provided an estimate for the cost to redo the lines. Um, why do you feel um, the 400000 should cover it? Um, is this the uh, consultant that's giving you this, or what's it based on? That is an estimate um, that the project manager and myself came up with. Um, it's based on the cost we saw for them to pull wires when we were looking at undergrounding, um, and it 
kind of a back of the envelope estimate they had given us at the beginning uh, when we first realized we have a conflict of what it would cost to relocate the wires. So I'd like to say it's more scientific than that, but it, it's really our best feeling at this point. Okay. Is 400000 fairly conservative? Um, engineering conservative. Engineering conservative. Um, I, I actually think that um, is a good number. I wouldn't say we're, we're padding it at all. Um, I think between 300 and 400 is where I truly expect it to come in. Okay, thanks. Uh, Council Member Bottorf, any questions? I do, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, Steve, um, so it looks like we have uh, two, the contingencies got hit by two things. One was the rain delays, which you saw, and the other one was it appears that there's over $400,000 in delays that are all tied to the indecision about uh, relocating the wires. Is that correct? Indecision or just delays, yes. Um, the delay, right. Extending well, the contracts, yes. Do. yes. Right, I, I got it. So, so that solves that. Is there any, I don't know how else to name it, are there any delays because of COVID? Are, we, are there any things that's causing them or, or not allowing them to work that's going to add any other delays? So we have not included any COVID cost delays um, in the numbers you saw tonight. Right now, the, all the contractor and subs have been able to keep working. Um, there's a potential th that one of the subs um, who's going to place the high roof steel once we get there, uh, may have some issues, but um, that'll be after the n next order comes out. So we're anticipating at this point no COVID-19 delay costs. Okay. And the uh, I mean, my memory goes back on this because I paid attention to this in the beginning. It, it, and my recollection says that when we were talking about when we first were notified that the, uh, that the, uh, the eaves were going to go into the, the uh, space where, where wires were not allowed to exist, uh, the first number for us to move the power lines was $180,000 to relocate the wires and 300000 to underground. Uh, do you recall those numbers? That, that sounds <laughs> vaguely familiar, unfortunately, yes. Okay. Because, we, you know, we, we, we all saw that the 300 went to 700 for underground and the 700 went to 1.3. So, you know, going along with, uh, with Council Member Tran's uh, uh, skepticism, you know, I, I'm, I, this was a $180,000 repair that is now, you know, you, 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 I know you're giving your best estimate and I, and I realize that this is an ever changing thing, but, uh, I, I don't know how much confidence I can play and put in that number, but the bottom line is whatever the number is, our contingency and the extra money we were got from the county and the other funds is enough to cover this even if it went to 500000 Yes, it is at this point. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, Council Member Story, questions? Yes, I have one question. Steve, um, if uh, everything goes well and we end up with a surplus uh, in the budget, where does that go? I think we are paying with the general fund money in the project last, so it would be refunded to the general fund. Got a nod from the finance director on that. So yes, the general fund money will be the the last out, and uh, any available funds at the end would be returned there. So just to, any surplus or savings we have in this project would go back. All of it would go back to the general fund. So, so I can answer that. I think, if I recall, I believe we put around a million dollars of general fund money. One five. So as long as you know, that would be the first money we would take back out. If we ended up with more than one point five million dollars, who I don't, I don't think that's possible at this point. Then we would be talking about <clears throat> that would be restricted library funding that we would need to put back into the library system. Okay, so the general fund is like uh, first in order for any surplus up into the up to the maximum contribution. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Vice Mayor Save Brooks. money. Oh. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, any questions? I have no questions. Thank you. No questions. And forgive me, Councilmember Bertrand, did I already ask you if you had questions? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, with that, we will bring this item to public comment. Did we receive any public comment on this item? 
Looks like we are seeing none. So we will bring it back to the council for uh, additional comments and deliberation. Can you bring the recommendation slide back up? Great, thank you. All right, um, council member, uh, council member Bertrand, any additional comments or discussion? No, I hats off to the uh, window installers to make that happen. But otherwise, I'm definitely want to accept this staff presentation. Okay. Councilmember Botworth? I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve staff recommendation uh, authorizing uh, up to $400,000. I'll second that. Motion by Councilmember Botworth, second by Councilmember Bertrand. Uh, Councilmember Story, any additional comments or discussion? No further comments or discussion. Thank you. All right. And Vice Mayor Brooks? No, I don't have any comments. All right. Uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand? Aye. Councilmember Botorf? Aye. Councilmember Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And Mayor Peterson? Aye. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you Council. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. We are going to move on to item 7D, a update on revised zoning code for Coastal Commission certification. Right. Hello. Hello. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and City Council. Um, now that we've updated our accessory dwelling unit ordinance and the sign ordinance, it's time to jump back into the zoning code update. We're getting very close to submitting a draft to the Coastal Commission with only four outstanding issues to resolve. Tonight I'm going to give you an overview of the zoning code update and an overview of the Coastal Commission certification process. Our new zoning code was adopted by City Council on January 25th, 2018. Next slide, please. The new zoning code took oh. effect in areas outside the coastal zone 30 days after the ordinance was adopted. Zoning code must be certified by the Coastal Commission prior to taking effect inside the coastal zone. You are muted. You are unmuted. Right. Uh, since the adoption of the ge in January of 2018, I've been working with the Coastal Commission staff, our planning commission, and our city council towards Coastal Commission certification. Next slide, please. Following adoption in 2018, staff provided a copy of the zoning code update to the Coastal Commission. Due to the volume of the document, it took the Coastal Commission a significant amount of time to review. In November of 2018, we got uh, Coastal Commission's redline version of our code. In early 2019, the Planning Commission reviewed the Coastal staff's red lines during two Planning Commission meetings and provided a recommendation to the City Council. Currently, the Coastal Commission edits are under review by City Council. Next slide, please. You will recall that in um, April, May, and June of last year, we discussed the Coastal Commission revisions. The outcome of the, these meetings was a list of requested Coastal Commission staff edits that appeared to not align with the Coastal Act. In June, City Council asked staff to work with the Coastal Commission staff to uh, resolve the outstanding issues. We provided the list to the Coastal Commission staff asking for references to the Coastal Act and where the specific issues that we'd identified could be referenced. In December of 2019, we received um, thorough responses to, the, to our list and staff met with the Coastal Commission staff in person. Uh, during this December meeting, it was very productive. It resulted in almost all items being resolved in align with the Coastal Act and Capitola's Coastal Land Use Plan. So at this point um, in the process last December, um, that was right when the new ADU laws took effect. So at this point, um, we put the Coastal Commission update on hold to focus on the ADU ordinance and also our sign ordinance. Next slide, please. Um, so let's get into next steps. This is where we are at this point. Um, in May, I plan to bring forth chapter 17.4, the coastal overlay zone. This is the chapter that had the majority of the outstanding issues. There were two other minor issues that I'll also bring forth during that May meeting. 
Following the May 14th meeting, there are three more items to get final direction on. The first is the village parking requirement. Second is the village hotel height. And last, the Monarch Cove Inn. Um, and of course, if any um, city council members have any additional items that they would like placed on an agenda, please let me know. Uh, next slide, please. Once I've received direction from the city council all, on all the remaining items, we'll publish a final draft for adoption hearings. Um, first, the planning commission, it'll go before the planning commission for recommendation and then final adoption by city council. I'm hoping we can achieve that this summer. Um, following the adoption hearings, we will submit to the Coastal Commission for certification. I'm, I've got two slides to, to revisit the process of Coastal Commission certification. So next slide, please. Um, so this would be the best outcome. We'd submit the draft to the Coastal Commission. They would, they'll do a completeness review. Um, once they've found our application complete, they're, they typically would put you on, a, on schedule for an adoption hearing within 60 days. We've done so much work up front that this is a possibility because um, they've reviewed our code several times at this point. If approved, the certified LCP goes into effect within the coastal zone. The second path forward, next slide please, is the Coastal Commission, I should, uh, Clarify, it never denies an LCP update. They simply provide you with red lines of your LCP update for approval. And then they give the um, Capitola the option of whether or not they want to move forward with the red lines. So, um, Jamie? Uh, so, with the red lines, Capitola can accept the red lines, and then we would have a certified LCP. Next, Jamie. Um, if Capitola does not accept the red lines, we have the option of making revisions and resubmitting the LCP with the revisions. And then lastly, if, um, if we do not accept the red lines and take no further action, we could operate as we do today under two separate codes. Um, in summary, the steps we've taken over the past nine months have gotten us closer to our goal of having one zoning code applied citywide. We've worked closely with the Coastal Commission. I feel that we're in a a great place uh, with four, four remaining items. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions and we'll be bringing back chapter 44 at the next hearing. All right, thank you. Um, let me see, where did my list go? Okay, uh, Council Member Botchworth, do you have any questions? I have no questions, thank you, Katie. Council Member Story? No questions. Thank you. Vice Mayor Brooks? No questions. And Council Member Bertrand, do you have any questions? I think we have him muted or he's on mute again. No. Nope. You are muted. Oh. You are unmuted. We'll figure it out. Council Member Bertrand, do you have any questions? I don't think he's muted. Uh, oh, huh. wait. Oh, there we go. But now he is muted. Councilmember Bertrand, are you back in the in the meeting? Yeah, I'm back. All right. Any questions? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm back. Yes, welcome back. Do you have any questions? Uh, no questions at this time. I was trying to get my video and I couldn't get that. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to. I, I can't see the slides. That's the problem. We are in the era of technical difficulties. Okay, uh, yeah. no questions. We'll bring it to public comment. Uh, did you receive any um, comments from members of the public on this item? Seeing none, we will close public comment for this item and bring it back to council for additional comment. Uh, do we need to vote or this is just a Information. Informational. Okay, great. Uh, so then we'll just go uh, quickly down the line again and see if there's any final comments. Councilmember Botorf? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have no comments. Thank you, Councilmember Story? No comments. All right, Vice Mayor Brooks? I just want to um, thank Kitty for this presentation. This was by far one of the most 
easiest to understand out of this entire process. I would just ask that these, um, that this particular slide that's up um, is brought back just so we can kind of remind ourselves where we are in the process in May. Great. Uh, Council Member Bertrand, any additional comments? Yes, uh, I would like to ask the Community Development Director to send me a copy of her slides. Um, that was my problem. I couldn't see her presentation for some reason. Okay, is it my problem? That. I'm sure. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. We, that, we, we will get. They will get that to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And also, thank you for. The, I understand you created this mask. Yes. I'm yes. And I would ask. like to thank you for making it, and to Chloe for allowing me to commandeer it from her at the last <laughs> meeting. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we are at the end of tonight's agenda. Thank you all uh, so much for everything you do for our city. That's for all of our staff here. Um, thank you all for watching. Please stay safe, stay socially distanced, take care of yourselves, and take care of each other. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.